Okay, we, it is July 31st. We are at the Dhammasukha Meditation Center with Bhante Vimala Ramsey. Tonight we're going to do Majima Nikaya 106, The Way to the in, Imperturbable, the Anujasapaya Sutta. And thus have I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living in the Kuru country where there is a town of the Kurus named Kama Sadama. There the blessed one addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the blessed one said this. Monks, sensual pleasures are permanent, are impermanent, hollow, false, deceptive. They are illusory, the prattle of fools. Sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Both alike are Mara's realm, Mara's domain, Mara's bait, Mara's hunting ground. On account of them, these evil and wholesome mental states such as covetousness, ill will, and presumption arise and they constitute an obstruction to a noble disciple in training here. Therein, monks, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come constitute an obstruction to the noble disciple in training here. Suppose I were to abide with a mind abundant, exalted, having transcended the world and made a firm determination with the mind. When I do so, there will be no more evil unwholesome states such as covetousness, ill will, and presumption in me. With the abandoning of them, my mind will be unlimited, immeasurable, and well-developed. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there is full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. What I'm teaching you to do is how to resolve on these things with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body. After death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. That means getting into one of the Brahma Lokas. Brahma Lokas last for a long period of time. Now here he's talking about the fourth jhana where you don't have any gross perceptions of form. But if there is contact with something you will know that there there that it is there. <clears throat> this monks is declared to be the first way directed to the imperturbable again monks a noble disciple considers thus there are sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perception in lives to come Whatever material form there is, all material form is the four great elements. What are the four great elements? Earth, fire, wind, and air, that's right. And the material form derived from those great elements. In other words, everything that is material has these four elements in it. 
<clears throat> when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there is full confidence, he it either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom on the dissolution of the body after death it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable this monks is declared to be the second way directed to the imperturbable so it's talking about going into the arupa jhanas into uh, the way you're practicing right now compassion with infinite space and this is the second one and this is uh, the realm of infinite consciousness again monks a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come sensual perception here and now and sensual perception in lives to come material forms here and now and material forms in lives to come perceptions of form here and now and perception of forms in lives to come both alike are impermanent what is impermanent is not worth delighting in not worth welcoming not worth holding to not worth identifying with when he practices in this way frequently abides thus his mind acquires confidence in this base once there's full confidence he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom always wisdom is talking about seeing how the links of dependent origination actually do work on the dissolution of the body after death it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable that means the Brahma Lokas when you get into the Brahma Lokas when you're getting into infinite space and infinite consciousness nothingness like that when you're reborn in a Brahma Loka it lasts for a long long time now there's the Asankaya the Asankaya is one of the four phases of the way the universe actually works and Asankaya is equivalent to 10 with 160 zeros behind it that's how long uh, how long an Asankaya lasts so it's a long time I never stopped to ask I just read it uh, now then when you have the four Asankayas you have the expansion of the universe which is what we're doing right now and then everything stops for an Asankaya and then it contracts for an Asankaya and then it starts expanding it, then it stops for an Asankaya and then it starts expanding again that is called a Mahakapa when you get into the realm of infinite space and you don't go any further than that you will re be reborn in a Brahma Loka that lasts for 20,000 years 
Mahakapas. Now this is a strictly mental realm. You don't have a physical body. And it, it is said to be a very, very, very pleasant abiding. And when the, car the good karma of your getting to that space finally fades away, then you'll be reborn in another Brahma Loka, but not for so long. <coughs> it, it can be anywhere from one Mahakapa to 500 Mahakapas depending on your your merit at that time then you will the good merit of that will disappear and you'll be reborn in either a Devaloka or a human being or you can even be reborn in a hell realm depending on your karma at that time So, this is uh, what I'm showing you in the way of meditation is such good karma that you'll be reborn in a pleasant abiding for huge long periods of time. on the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. This monks is declared the third way directed to the imperturbable. Again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come material form here and now and material forms in lives to come perception of forms here and now and perception of forms in lives to come perception of the imperturbable all are perceptions. What is perception? It's the naming of things. It's where concepts arise. Where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful. That is the sublime, namely the base of nothingness. When you get into the base of nothingness, you have the feeling of equanimity. Their mind is not looking outside of itself anymore. Now you're starting to really see more closely how different links of dependent origination arise and pass away. This is where you need to learn how to adjust your energy to a very fine degree. If you try too hard, you're going to get restless. If you don't stay with your object of meditation, but kind of let your mind slip off a little bit, then you're going to get dull. So you have to <coughs> you have to be able to adjust tiny little bits. If you're restless, you have to back off a little bit, not hold on to your object of meditation so tightly, let it be. And that's what I mean by backing off. But just a little bit until your mind is in balance and that equanimity comes up and now you can stay with that more easily. 
when you get into the realm of nothingness you will start to sit for longer periods of time without distraction when you're sitting is good you might be able to sit for 20 minutes 30 minutes 45 minutes without any distraction at all and you're staying with your object of meditation you're radiating that feeling of equanimity when I say you're radiating I mean you're noticing how it radiates by itself you are not making it happen okay okay when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus his mind acquires confidence in the base once there's full confidence he either attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom on the dissolution after after death it is possible the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness this monks is declared to be the first way directed to the base of nothingness if you die and you don't go any deeper in your meditation you will be reborn in a Brahma Loka that lasts for 60,000 Mahakapas again monks a noble disciple gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or an empty hut considers thus this is void of a self or of what belongs to a self when he practices in this way frequently abides thus his mind acquires confidence in the base now some of uh, what is talking about here it's void of a self that means it's void of craving there is no tightness in your mind when you stay on your object of meditation when your mindfulness gets weak then you start to have a, a disturbance arise you're not in that jhana anymore so you need to use your six R's and just let it be but don't keep your attention on it and come back to your object of meditation <coughs> anything that that says about being void of self or what belongs to a self is talking about the letting go of craving that is major craving always manifests as I like it or I don't like it and that is the start of the false belief in a personal self when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus his mind acquires confidence in this base once there's full confidence he either attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom what I'm teaching you is to resolve upon it with wisdom and the reason that I'm teaching that is because that is the direct path to truly understanding how things arise how they're there for a period of time how they cease and you'll get to be able to see all, a lot of the different links when you're doing that <coughs> uh, 
On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. This, monks, is declared to be the second way directed to the base of nothingness. Again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus, I am not anything belonging to anyone, anywhere. Nor is there anything belonging to me, in anyone, anywhere. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now, or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. This, monks, is declared to be the third way directed to the base of nothingness. Again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Material form here and now and material forms in lives to come. Perceptions of form here and now and perceptions of form in lives to come. Perceptions of the imperturbable. And perceptions of the base of nothingness. All are perceptions. Where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful, that is the sublime, namely the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And this is truly where it is peaceful. And you can sit for long periods of time, an hour, hour and a half, even longer, without having any disturbance. But when you start to see a disturbance starting to arise, you need to relax right then and let it be. Now, this is such a very subtle state to be in that you're taking mind as your object of meditation, that exquisite, peaceful, calm mind. That's your only object of meditation. Where before you were in, <coughs> you were in nothingness and you had equanimity that was very strong. Now the equanimity is too coarse a feeling because everything becomes so incredibly subtle. That's why you have to take, you have to have an object of meditation always. So you take the object of meditation as uh, the peaceful, calm mind. When he, <clears throat> when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind again acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the base of neither perception nor non-perception now, or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass to, on to rebirth in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This, monks, is declared to be the way directed to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. If you never go any higher than the base of neither perception nor non-perception, <coughs> and you die in that realm, you will be in a Brahma Loka, 
in uh, immaterial realm for 84,000 Mahakapas. That is truly a long time. When this was said, the Venerable Nanda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, Venerable Sir, here a monk is practicing thus. It might not be and it might not be mine. It will not be and it will not be mine. What exists has come to be. That I am abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity. Venerable Sir, does such a monk attain Nibbana? One monk here, Ananda, might attain Nibbana and another monk might not attain Nibbana. What is the cause and reason, Venerable Sir, why one monk here might attain Nibbana? Well, another monk here might not attain Nibbana. Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might not be and it might not be mine. It will not be and it will not be mine. What exists has come to be and that I am abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity. He delights in that equanimity, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As he does so, his consciousness becomes dependent on it and clings to it. Clings to it means what? Start having thoughts about it and taking it personally. A monk with craving and clinging Ananda does not attain Nibbana. So even that little bit of longing of wanting something to happen in a particular way, that longing will stop you from going deeper. So you have to start making up your mind that when you sit, you make a determination of it doesn't matter what arises, It doesn't matter what kind of hindrance comes up. And you start to gain disenchantment or, or the excitement of something coming up. Oh, I want to see that. You lose that and you become dispassionate. Uh, then, yeah, this is just this. Is nothing. <clears throat> but venerable sir, when that monk craves and clings, what does he crave and cling to? To the base of neither perception nor non-perception. You can crave, you can have craving and clinging to that state because it is so peaceful and quiet and you want it to stay that way. Okay? <coughs> when that monk craves and clings, Venerable Sir, excuse me, it seems he craves and clings to the best object of craving and clinging. When that monk craves and clings, Venerable uh, Ananda, he, he cling, craves and clings to the best object of craving and clinging. For this is the best object of craving and clinging, namely the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Why? Because you can sit for long periods of time where there is no disturbance. But liking it even a tiny bit will stop you from going deeper. Having the thought, well, yeah, this is right, this is good, 
will stop you from going deeper. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Doesn't matter what it is. You have to make a strong determination to let go of any attachment to anything. Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might not be and it might not be mine. It will not be and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Even the slightest little vibration. And it does get subtle. But you're still, you, you still know that there's more deeper that as you go and improve your practice you can still have some very subtle little tiny things that can arise now I was telling you before that was a hundred thousand arising and passing away of the twelve links of dependent origination a hundred thousand times. It gets much more and more subtle. As your mindfulness improves, you start catching it a little bit quicker and a little bit quicker and a little bit quicker. <coughs> and a, a feeling just starts to arise and your mind just relaxes into that. It's not so big that you even know that it's there, but it is there. Because when you let go, there's a sense of relief. Your mind will sit for even a longer period of time without any disturbance. He does not delight in that equanimity, welcome and remain holding to it. He doesn't he doesn't delight in anything anymore. Mind is just peaceful, calm. And when you let go of those subtle little desires, I wonder when Nibbana is gonna happen. You have to let it go because that thought itself turns into a hindrance. When you have true dispassion, it's just like you're sitting in a movie house and you're watching a movie. All this stuff can come and go and it can be all these subtle little things and you start noticing more and more subtle little things but it's just having the mind that observes without any desire at all. That's how you attain Nibbana. Since he does not do so, his consciousness does not become dependent on it. So even the peaceful, calm mind, you have to let that be the way it's going to be. You cannot try to control anything. Everything that arises, it arises by itself. You're not there. It's just this slight amount of disturbance. So you allow it to be there and relax and come back to that peaceful, calm mind. When you start to gain more confidence, when you start to gain more surety of being able to sit there without having any kind of desire or want for anything to happen, then you start noticing more and more little tiny subtle things. And your mind will start to be on automatic. It just starts to come up. I mean, it's like a 
boiling water and the first tiny little bubble that starts to come up, you're able to recognize it and relax. A monk without craving and clinging ananda attains nibbana. It is wonderful, venerable sir, it is marvelous. The blessed one indeed has explained to us the crossing of the flood in dependence upon one support or another. But venerable sir, what is noble deliverance? Here Ananda, a noble disciple, considers thus sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Material forms here and now and material forms in lives to come. Perception of forms here and now and perception of forms in lives to come. Perception of the imperturbable, perception of the base of nothingness, and perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is identity as far as identity extends. This is the deathless, namely, the liberation of mind through not craving or clinging. Thus, Ananda, I have taught the way directed to the imperturbable. I have taught the way directed to the base of nothingness. I have taught the way directed to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I have taught the way crossing the flood in dependence upon one support or another. I have taught noble liberation what should be done for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them. That I have done for you, Ananda. There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, Ananda. Do not delay or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. That's what the Blessed One said, and the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So the imperturbable means there's no disturbance. Mind is just... Ta. And of course you're not going to be able to do that every sitting. Your mind is going to take off and go here and there. And that's not a bad thing in and of itself. Because when a hindrance or a disturbance arises, your mind is letting you know that you have to improve your mindfulness a little more. There's still some things there that you haven't noticed. So you don't make the hindrances your enemy or something to fight with or something to try to control. It's just a hindrance. Did you ask it to come up? No. There is no control over it. It might stay for a long peri period of time. It might disappear. Your job is to not keep your attention on the hindrance. A hindrance is going to last as long as it lasts. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you let it be there let it stay as long as it wants to stay, but you keep your attention on your object of meditation. Eventually, that hindrance will stop pulling your attention to it, and when that happens, you go deeper into your meditation. 
So the hindrance is actually teaching you great lessons. The only time there's really any real problem with hindrances is when you think you have to control them. The only way to gain absolute, absolute control over things is by letting go of all control. <clears throat> yeah, there's going to be things that arise. Yeah, your mind is not going to be as sharp as you want it all the time. That's okay. Because that hindrance is helping you to develop your mindfulness even more. When that hindrance fades away, your mind goes deeper, you will get into a very pleasurable, peaceful, calm realm where nothing is there. And you take that mind as your object of meditation. So when you finally make up your mind that you're not in control of anything, then you start to get dispassionate towards everything. Yeah, it's there. So what? Never mind can be there, can last as long as it wants. I don't have to over-investigate it to see what it is so I can put a name on it. Don't need to do that. All you need to do is allow that feeling to be there but not keep your attention on it. Keep your attention on that clear, bright mind. <clears throat> eventually your awakening factors will get into perfect balance. When that happens, that's when the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness occurs. When you come out of that exceptionally pure state and then you stay with your object of meditation, you will start to see how the cause and effect of these past actions start to occur in the links of the dependent origination. And you will see how it arises. And you will see that if this doesn't arise, that won't arise. If that doesn't arise, this won't arise. And you will see the cessation of all of the links of dependent origination. When you see that, and you get to seeing the formation just disappear, there are no more conditions for the links of dependent origination to arise that is the conditionless state. It is the signless state. It is Nibbana. Okay? So it doesn't matter what kind of games your mind wants to play. Your job is to <clears throat> allow it to be. And you can always ask yourself, if something comes up, should I 6R that? If you don't recognize it as being too much energy or too little energy, but there's still something there, you can ask yourself and your intuition will give you the right answer. Follow your intuition. The intuition is that little tiny quiet voice that with your daily activities you kind of forget about. It's still giving you information, 
but if you have concerns of one thing or another <coughs> or you have an attachment to one thing or another your intuition is hard to hear because you're speaking so loudly to yourself about other things that's why you want to get to a state where there's very very few thoughts and the only thoughts that really arise are what I call observation thoughts observation thought mind is very still right now not my mind doesn't have anything to do with me mind is very still if you put a judgment on it I like that you're not in there anymore and now you have to work with more hindrances so it's a very important fact to allow things to be and not judge good bad or indifferent just it's okay it can be there and your mind will start going deeper and deeper into your meditation that's the way it works so do you have any questions the imperturbable starts at the fourth jhana is it reference somewhere else in the uh, Nikayas? Well, it talks about it quite a bit in the same Nikaya, but it doesn't, uh, the, the translator is the same translator for both books, but he doesn't use the same language for both books. He changes things up. The same Nikaya is, it, it has a lot of that. And actually, the Angutra Nikaya uh, it talks about it but it talks in a way that you really have to know what you're looking for to see it yeah <coughs> okay anything else I'll share some merit then <coughs> Be suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sad.